Hey, welcome to my podcast. My name is Dr. Brendan McCarthy. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Protea Medical Center in Chandler, Arizona. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Before we get started, if you wouldn't do me, if you wouldn't mind doing me a favor, already mumbling a little bit. Sorry, Justin. I promised Justin I wouldn't say um today, and I wouldn't be on point, and my my elocution, as they say, would be perfect. But uh, today I'm already starting off with a flub. Sorry. Anyway, if you have a moment, please click below, subscribe, and uh, we'll get started with today's episode. Today, I wanted to talk about something that's been brought up to me a few times uh, with comments that we get in the reels, but also on, on YouTube. And I've gotten some emails from people regarding this, asking me regarding endometriosis and our approach to endometriosis and how I would view that with a patient um, and whether I do treat endometriosis. And I do. The answer to that is true uh, that I do treat endometriosis. I've seen it you know, throughout my whole career. I've been practicing for 20 plus years. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, if you're new to the podcast, hi, my name is Dr. Brennan McCarthy, as I mentioned. Um, I've been in practice for 20 years. I am a licensed naturopathic medical doctor in the state of Arizona. I primarily focus on endocrine health in women. I do do some endocrine health in men as well. Uh, we also do, you know, occasional dietary work with people, nutritional work with people. My practice has over the course of my career been focused primarily though on women and the intersection between their hormones and their brain chemistry. One of the areas where I love in my practice is the impact of balancing a woman's hormones on her brain chemistry, on her mood, and its ability to help them manage anxiety, depression, insomnia. And it has been an incredibly rewarding 20 years. And, and even when we don't get it right, we keep circling back till we do. And, and being in that role is humbling. To, to see someone's life change like that has always been humbling. I think as a physician, the things that get me most excited is when someone's life is better from having that interaction. And I love these relationships I have with my patients. One other area that I become that I have been very passionate about again for the course of my career has been fertility, and you know I have a, a handful of great fertility cases under my belt that just um, stay with me throughout my career. I remember the cases of the patient before they were able to conceive and the anxiety. I remember the fear, all the sense of inadequacy, all those things that go into it, and. Then I remember the elation on the other end of it. Now I know that not every case of infertility can be cured. I know, I know. I also know that every case deserves 100% from the physician. So today's topic on endometriosis actually falls a little bit into uh, fertility for me. And I'll explain why. And I'll start with a case study. This is a recent case that I saw. A patient presented to clinic. In her history, she uh, had a long-term history uh, when she was in her early 20s, late teens and early 20s, rather, of uh, painful periods, you know, difficult uh, cycle, um, pain with intimacy. And her doctors, uh, it was difficult for me to get her full history. I could not get her charts from her previous physicians because it had been a little bit too long. In Arizona, I think it's a seven-year window. You can get their charts, but after seven years, there's no charts left. So um, so I'm going off of her her personal experience and what she went through. But you know, she went to the doctor, and the doctors basically started her on birth control right away. And birth control was meant to help manage her symptoms of painful cycles, dysmenorrhea. And they were there to help her even they felt would help her with her pain with um, intercourse. So she tried several different kinds. She finally found one that worked and worked all right. And she was good. And then now she presents back to my clinic in her mid thirties. And the reason why she presented back to clinic at 34 rather is that she is now has come off of oral contraceptives because she wishes to conceive her and her husband wish to conceive and her periods are back to where they were before. Very uncomfortable, very painful. And intimacy is very painful. So 
what what was this? What is this? And 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 why? Let me step back even further for a moment. And she presented to clinic. She's like, my periods are painful. It's difficult, and we have not been able to get pregnant. That was that was the reason why she came in. So what what is this? What happened to her? So she has endometriosis. This is I just want you to know that's the diagnosis we have with her right now. And when she was in her late teens and early twenties, instead of working her up for endometriosis, she was put on oral contraceptives. She did not know she had endometriosis. She did not know that endometriosis would be, would make, would be an obstacle for her to conceive. She did not know that when she decided to come off of oral contraceptives, her symptoms would return right away and that we would need to address endometriosis in order to see if she could become pregnant. So now at 34, off of contraceptives, endometriosis is present. She now has to figure out and work out fertility. Now, those of you at 34 years old who have been 34 trying to conceive, the window starts tightening up at that point. There's a lot of things that are said to you when you're in your mid to late 30s that are not very fair regarding your ability to conceive. And, and I'm, I'm not going to dive into that too deeply, but there's a lot of stress in that time frame. And if there's going to be delay in that time to conceive, it's even harder on you. When she was in her late teens and early 20s, instead of just putting her on contraceptives and setting her on her way, if we had sat down with her and we had said, even if we put on contraceptives to stabilize her, because that worked, it would have been good for the physician to circle back and say, we have endometriosis here. We need to figure you out. We need to discuss your plans for fertility. We want to talk about you being a mom. When women present to clinic with painful periods and the only thing their care provider does is write them contraceptives, they're, they're not providing medical care. They're just stabilizing you. And then when they keep refilling it to you for years or a decade or two, they're still not, they're just keeping you stable without really understanding what's going on with you. And there are often consequences to that. In this case, her family. Not every woman experiences endometriosis like this. Some women, as soon as they have endometriosis, they're, you know, oftentimes you'll see women being admitted to this and having surgical procedures to remove it. Laparoscopy is being done, or they're put on, you know, severe uh, um, caniotropin releasing hormone uh, inhibitors. There, there's different things we do to treat that in severe cases, but it's common to have this also. So in these cases, these ones that fall in that gray area where they just were stabilized and left on their own, you know, is there a way to treat it better? Like, and that's the point of this episode is like twofold in here. I want to convey two, two things with you. One is you deserve better than just being put on a med and parked there for the rest of your life. You deserve someone to understand you. We spend a profound amount of time in medical school and in pre-med to understand you. I dedicated so much of my life. The best part of my life, people would say in my 20s, my 30s, <laughs> learning to be a doctor. You know, I should have been out partying. I didn't party that. You know, was, you know what I'm trying to say? Was, uh, to be this guy, to know these things, to be helpful. And it's a tragedy when we don't use that knowledge at all. Because the algorithm for writing contraceptives is a very shallow algorithm, meaning there's not much you need to do. Painful periods, birth control. The birth control will work, try this birth control. That one to work, try this birth control. And that's all it is. It's very shallow. So you as a woman, as a human being, deserve the doctor to understand you and to bend as much of this around you as possible. And they may not always get it right. And you'll see them trying, and that's how you know. I'm not even saying you need the perfect doctor in the world. You just need the doctor who gives a, a damn about you and who wants to be there for you, who's dedicated to you. That's my first thing in this. And I use this, I talk about this a lot in this podcast. If you think about it, I, you know, almost every episode is me, me calling out to that. 
The second thing is, is that for those of you with endometriosis, what can you do? What can you do to help manage these symptoms? What can you do to help reduce down the impact uh, uh, of this, you know, estrogen, you know, dependent pathology? So here we go. I want to start with the incidence. And this is what's fascinating to me. 10%, 10% of reproductive age women uh, will have endometriosis. You know, generally it's women who uh, have uh, dysmenorrhea, of course, is the primary presentation, but, you know, it's women who are subfertile, um, women with pain with intercourse. And, and, and these are how they present to clinic. But, you know, 10% of the population, 10% of reproductive age women, that's a lot. It's huge. So what, what is, what causes endometriosis or what is it really? Let's get into that one. That's important. Endometriosis is when you have tissue outside of the lining of the uterus that's responding to estrogen in a pathological way. I'm being vague on purpose right now. And how it gets there, there's a lot of different theories. One is that there's, you know, uh, reflux through the uh, uh, fallopian tube and that, you know, when, when it contracts, you'll have the uh, endometrial lining will move itself through the uh, fallopian tube into the peritoneum. There are those who believe it's transferred through blood, or some some people do. It's, it's transferred through the lymphatic tissue. There's important research being done showing that environmental toxins, you know, environment and endocrine disrupting compounds, plastics primarily in the environment, are affecting uh, women in their development in uh, the time called mini puberty that happens in the first year of life. In the first year of your life, you'll have a big surge of these hormones that are associated with being a woman. And these hormones hit a certain level that helps set the stage for when you do go through puberty. It's part of the whole process of development. And during that mini puberty, if you have endocrine disrupting compounds present in your body, it alters some of that structure. And that allows for that endometrial lining to be found in different locations. This is a fascinating uh, uh, research in that area. And I think that's important for us to be understanding because that's a growing area of concern. Um, children and, and um, prenatal and perinatal uh, and postnatal children being uh, exposed to environmental, uh, excuse me, endocrine disrupting compounds from the environment. So, when you have tissue outside of the uterus that's supposed to be inside the uterus, that's estrogen responsive. Every time you have a cycle, every time you have a cycle, let's talk about a cycle. The first two weeks, estrogen is dominant. Estrogen stimulates all those parts of you associated with fertility, the lining of the uterus, the breasts, cervix, ovaries collagen, all that stuff, bones, all these things. It stimulates that tissue, which is good. It's just when that surge of estrogen occurs and it stimulates estrogen-responsive tissue where it's not supposed to be. So now you have thickening of tissue that's not in the uterus anymore. It's somewhere else in the peritoneum or in the, in the lower abdomen, you know, in the pelvic area, and that swells up. That's what creates that pain. Now, the thing is this with estrogen. It is very common in women who have estrogen dominance. And it's common to occur in women during that time in their lives where they have not fully established a cycle and they tend to just have too much estrogen all month long. So again, a normal cycle, estrogen is dominant for the first two weeks. You ovulate, estrogen becomes less dominant, progesterone comes up, progesterone goes back to that tissue that estrogen is stimulated and it calms it down. It, it brings back the line of the uterus and, and organizes a little bit better. It gets more blood flow to it. It stops from growing. You have uh, uh, progesterone goes to the breast tissue. It stops that from being you know, overstimulated and lobulizes that tissue. So progesterone is that balancing act for the estrogen. In women with endometriosis, they tend to have estrogen all month long. They tend not to ovulate. It's a very common factor in them is they, they have subpar ovulation, so they don't really make very much progesterone. Instead, they just keep having estrogen all month long, and lab work will support that. This disorder, this condition, endometriosis, is estrogen-dependent. Estrogen causes this, especially estrogen dominance. How do I approach that? What do I think of when I see that? When that woman presents to clinic, you know, um, the first thing we look to is, is are they ovulating? Are they cycling? Do they make progesterone in the second two weeks of their cycle? Is their estrogen too high? So I'll run the lab work. And I'll run it day 21 of the cycle to start just to, just to get a picture there. And if they don't have any progesterone and they have estrogen being on the higher end of normal, then you have it. And that's very common. 
So then my question is, is why aren't they ovulating? Why are they just keeping estrogen all month long? Why aren't they at day 12 flipping the switch from estrogen to progesterone? What inhibits that? So as a physician, the first thing I think of is things that inhibit ovulation. Medically, you know, uh, uh, endocrinologically, most common ones could be prolactin. That's just, you got to watch for that one. And I can't tell you how many women have been told they'll never have a child. And they don't, they're never told the reason because the doctor never ran a prolactin. Prolactin labs are so easy to run. So we run a prolactin on the woman. Now say the prolactin is, is, is elevated. Say it's above 50, say it's 100. That lets us know there's a chance. There's something called a prolactinoma, which is a tumor in the pituitary gland. And this, this is common, manageable, okay? This is not the end of the world. It's common and it's manageable. But once we find that, we can manage that. We lower the prolactin down and you start to see them ovulate again. And fertility can be restored that way often. That's beautiful. And so if someone have a tumor in their head, medical management using cabergoline, which is one of the ones we use frequently in my practice. And uh, that's it, that's it. And then we monitor the, the prolactinoma over time. You know, that's what you want to maintain and watch for that. And people will live a long, beautiful life and have beautiful children. And that's great. And I, that's heartwarming. All I did is ran one lab, one prescription, one baby. <laughs> you know, it's easy. What if the prolactin is not 50? It's, so prolactin, in my opinion, my medical opinion, should be four or so. If it's ever higher than four, I'm suspicious. Because if it starts getting above four, the range goes to 20. I think it's 22. The more prolactin moves up that line, the more your body's going to be inhibiting ovulation. So even though your prolactin is normal at, say, 18, it's in the normal range, Brendan. Yeah, it's normal. Normal for what? You know? So if I see a prolactin at 17, that's in the normal range. How much ovulation is that inhibiting? Maybe it's 25 not high enough to be a tumor, or maybe you send her out for, for an a MRI and it comes back negative for a tumor and it's 25 or 30. What else could it be? Prolactin can be elevated from diet. I've said this in a previous episode and I, it bears to be report, repeated. What I'm about to say, it sounds insane. <laughs> so I want you to do me a favor. I want you to uh, Google this when I'm done. I want you to go to Google Scholar or just do regular Google. It doesn't matter, Bing, whatever search engines you're using out there. Fine, use that. And I want you to put in this, these terms. Gluten, exorphin, E-X-O-R-P-H-I-N, exorphin, B5, stimulates prolactin secretion. Just Google that. That'll bring you down the rabbit hole. When people consume gluten, not everyone, but many, when they consume gluten, their prolactin levels become elevated. And so if your prolactin levels get elevated, from gluten, that's going to slow down ovulation. And that's going to give you less progesterone, more estrogen. More estrogen, more stimulating that tissue where it doesn't belong. So, so we want to know if their prolactin is elevated due to a tumor. Prolactin can also be elevated due to diet. If it is, we change their diet. And gluten isn't the only thing. There are other things I look at too with diet, but gluten's the most common one. So prolactin is elevated due to diet. I figure that out. What else can raise prolactin? Stress, severe stress. And I mean, show me a woman in her teens and 20s that doesn't have a lot of stress. So we see prolactin being off. I also look at cortisol. What's her stress like? What's her life like? How is she? How is she? A lot of women experience trauma, severe trauma. And, and we normalize trauma in our lives because we get used to it. We're just, that's just what life is. We, we, we um, put it in terms that we can accept and we work through lives with trauma. But there are consequences to having trauma, and one of them is this. So I want to understand whether they're under severe stress, whether there's a history of trauma, then I want to go in there, I want to be helpful, and I'll refer as needed for that trauma. You know, complex uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder refer out to uh, uh, EMDR. Um, I don't know if I want to plug Kelly's podcast right here. That's a great podcast. I love that woman. She's my go-to referral person ever in my life. Um, her clinic her husband um, have an amazing clinic. They're just uh, very talented and gifted therapists. And when we send patients there, we get good results. So I'm happy for that. And that right there, fertility can be reliant upon just severe trauma and stress. And does that sound bizarre? Not really. Think about it. Like how many of you have had missed cycles due to severe stress? 
How many of you have had severe stress really compromising your normal menstrual cycle? Many, most. It's part of your biology. So, so that is an important thing for your physician to be aware of that too and care about you like that. Once we've figured those things out, whether they're ovulating, not ovulating, whether there's an issue with prolactin, cortisol, what if it's just still not responding? What else can I do? I'm fine with stepping into those situations with women who have uh, endometriosis and prescribing progesterone. So say you have low progesterone the second half of your cycle and it is prolactin or it is stress or it is you know quality of life or any number of different things. You're just not really ovulating very well. I'm going to give you progesterone the second half of your cycle. I'm fine with that. For day 18 to day 28 of a normal cycle, we use 200 to 400 milligrams of oral micronized progesterone dissolved sublingually. And what will that do? That's going to go back and it's going to help calm down that stimulation that estrogen was doing. That's going to help find a little bit more balance in the woman's body. That's going to stop the lining of the uterus from getting thick, but it's also going to help calm down that endometrial tissue that's located outside of the uterus, not be overly stimulated. That's helpful. If the woman has really high levels of estrogen, it, it, it helps, but it's not perfect. But it helps. It's important. Another thing it does for women with endometriosis, a lot of them present to clinic with anxiety, you know, and, and depression and, and insomnia. And progesterone is the key in there. If you have low progesterone, anxiety, depression, insomnia, that's why you have anxiety, depression, insomnia until proven otherwise. Because progesterone, when it's in your body, crosses the blood-brain barrier, goes to the brain, turns to allopregnanolone, Allopregnanolone is that beautiful anti-anxiety agent. When your progesterone levels are adequate in the brain, you're able to make your monoamines, which you would note as serotonin as melatonin, more efficiently. That helps with depression, insomnia, and anxiety. So progesterone can be help these women. That's a big player in them. So I always prescribe that. That is a key thing in endometriosis, in my opinion, in my practice. Sometimes, and you're going to think I'm a maniac right here. Gosh, man, any endocrinologist or, or Gynecologists might think I'm a maniac at first, but they'll bear with me. What I'm about to say, <laughs> it's like I'm setting this up. This could be something big, but testosterone, testosterone, yes, testosterone. Testosterone in women is a very tricky medication to use because it is not. You're supposed to have it as a woman. You need it, just like I need estrogen as a man. I'm not going to be healthy without estrogen. You're not healthy without testosterone. The delivery mechanism of testosterone in women is not perfect. It's just tricky. It always will be until they discover a new way of doing it or making a way where you don't need it anymore. You can make it naturally again. But low testosterone in women, when we treat it, we get that anti-estrogen effect because testosterone also poses estrogen in a woman's body. So it helps progesterone do its job. So we would consider testosterone. Now, why endocrinologists and, and gynecologists would think I'm a maniac for saying that? Because women with polycystic ovarian syndrome or women who have severe excess estrogen have been known to have hirsutism because they have high levels of something called dihydrotestosterone. That is possible. We do not give those women testosterone at all. In your lab work, if I see low testosterone and low dihydrotestosterone and high estrogen, I am inclined to considering using testosterone to help mitigate the impact of estrogen on the tissue in your body because it has been shown to do that. So we will use low-dose testosterone as well if that's indicated in those cases. Can you use testosterone to get pregnant? No. And there's journal articles on how you can use it at times, but in my clinic, no, I just don't. You know, it's just not, I just, it's a tough one to work with. It's, it's, um, it's not something I recommend when you're trying to get pregnant. But if you're trying to mitigate the side effects of having so much estrogen in your body, testosterone is a good tool so long as you don't have dihydrotestosterone elevations or you already already have testosterone elevations. You should not use it in those settings. It needs to be indicated. So testosterone should be on the table in certain circumstances and then monitored tightly with those women. I've told you now how I would approach this by getting them to ovulate again, figure out why they're not ovulating, how to get them to ovulate again. I've told you what my goal would be, what hormones I can use to mitigate the impact of estrogen on their reproductive tissue. I have talked to you about maybe these little testosterone background. What can I do to lower that estrogen though? Because estrogen, what if it's still high? What if they're not ovulating still, I'm giving them progesterone and I need to give them something to help curtail that estrogen a little bit. 
what can I do naturally? Some of the stuff I'm going to do uh, is going to be calcium deglucurate. I'm going to do 1.5 grams a day. Uh, I use a brand called Designs for Health because I know that brand, but I want you to know I don't work for them. They don't, I mean, they, I guess they know me because we buy stuff from them in the practice, but I don't have that one of the things I want you, I'm, when I tell you I like a supplement, it's not because they pay me. It's because I run the labs after using it, how that worked. Not all supplements are good quality. And it's, it's, it's buyer beware out there. So, you know, pure encapsulations is a good one. I use thorn. I use um, designs for health. You know, these are my big ones I use in the practice. There's a couple others, but those are the ones that come to mind right away. But calcium deglucurate at uh, 1.5 grams a day. And why we do that is because, let me go back. I want to help navigate estrogen out of your body naturally. So what the pathway is to get estrogen out of your body is it gets taken into your liver, it gets broken down, and then it gets eliminated through digestion and your bowel movements. So I want to induce getting estrogen into the liver to do its job. Diendolimethane, that comes from broccoli. 200 milligrams of DIM, it's called DIM, short for DIM. Uh, 200 milligrams, 400 milligrams a day, beautiful. In the liver, that first phase of detoxification, I'm gonna rec recommend vitamin B12, folic acid, magnesium, vitamin B6, methionine, inositol, and choline. All those things, all those things help. Then phase two of liver detoxification, make sure they're eating good amount of protein. So phase one, again, before phase one, to get estrogen into the liver detox, methane, that works great or more cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. Andrew Weil, Dr. Andrew Weil, was talking about this decades ago. <laughs> this is, it's a real thing, it works. Uh, and then we go to the first phase of liver detoxification, vitamin B12, folate. We wanna make sure that they're having plenty of uh, uh, vitamin B6. We wanna make sure that they're having plenty of um, methionine, inositol, and choline, and help the body move that first phase of liver detoxification. Phase two of liver detoxification, Make sure they're getting adequate levels of protein. Now, the end product is that estrogen is going to be released via bile into your bowel movement, into your intestinal tract to be released in the bowel movement. Now, this is a tricky place here is because sometimes that estrogen gets pulled back out and reabsorbed. It can be separated and pulled back out. Calcium deglucurate at 1.5 grams a day, as I mentioned, works wonderfully. That and fiber, that and fiber. So that's how I help get estrogen out of their body. If that doesn't work, gosh, that usually works really well. But if that doesn't work, am I afraid to use uh, an aromatase inhibitor? No. You know, I use an astrazol when needed, as needed. But I do all the other steps because if she's not metabolizing estrogen out of her body very well, what's going on with the rest of her liver? Does she have a deficiency of those nutrients, those cofactors? Running labs helps me understand those things. So if she presents to clinic and I put her on this protocol, say I'm going to help her reduce her estrogen, I'm going to recommend some of these supplements. I'm going to recommend the supplements. I'm going to run my labs a month later and make sure my work is sound. I never put a patient on supplements or medication without proving it did its job. That's not healthy to do it any other way. That's, not, that's a bridge too far. You know, you trust me to understand you and figure you out. I need to earn your trust by proving it did it. That's huge to me. So we run those labs to make sure. And if it didn't work, I take pride in my work. So if what my protocol didn't come together and you didn't get estrogen lower, I go back at it until I get it to work because that's my job. That's what a doctor does. A real doctor does that. Hold that standard. You deserve that standard. I'm going to close on this one part that's not easy to discuss. <laughs> No one wants to talk about diet. <laughs> no one wants to talk about diet. Um, my wife is a nutritionist and, uh, you know, she just did a couple podcast episodes with Justin yesterday. And it's so tricky to talk about diet because there's so much to it and so much charge to it. And we all know we need to be better with our diet. Very few people are already perfect with their diets, but the rest of us, we need to be better with our diets. There is so much research there's so much clinical experience that shows that women who have a whole foods diet, not shopping the store whole foods, I'm not, I'm talking about real food. Let me get to, I'll define whole foods in a second. But women who eat a whole foods diet have a lower incidence of endometriosis. 
women who eat a healthy, balanced diet. What is a healthy, balanced diet? What is a whole foods diet? It's, it's, um, it's shopping on the outside of the supermarket, so to speak. You're eating fruits and vegetables. You're eating proteins that are in their natural form. You're not eating things that are pre-prepared, frozen, processed, with synthetic things added to it. You're eating adequate levels of vegetables that have fiber in it. There's a percentage out of you out there that are like, I'll only ever eat vegetables. Blah. I'll never eat fruit. Blah. That doesn't work. I hear you don't like them. I know. It doesn't work, though. It's like saying I don't like oxygen. You know what I mean? You need to breathe. You need to eat fruits and vegetables. I know a lot of carnivores are going to yell at me right now for having said that, but just that is what it is. I am a firm believer in the need for fiber in your diet. I always will be. Plant-based fibers are important. There's different types of fibers out there. These are important things. Our ancestors have been doing it forever. That's what we do. So I do believe in consuming fruits and vegetables in a healthy way. I do believe in healthy proteins. I just know that when we process foods, synthetic foods, these things increase that risk. So with that said, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast. It means everything to me. Your comments, uh, your take on these things also help drive this podcast. So thank you for all of you who've been posting on Instagram, all of you who've been posting your comments on YouTube, all of you who've been sending me emails. Thank you for this. It, it means a lot to me because it, it means you're, you're reading it, <laughs> you're watching the channel, but more than that, it means that you find something useful out of it and you're helping me be better. Even the criticism, even the criticism, when it's nice, <laughs> what's nice criticism? Nice criticism is, is when you're saying, hey, I think you could have done that better. Hey, this, this wasn't very clear to me. Or, 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 hey, I don't agree with you. This is why. That's great. I love that. Personal attacks, nah, I don't like those. <laughs> no one does. But, but your, your, your comments help us be more of service and it helps me be better at this. So thank you. I will see you at the next episode.